offer a great, big, sincere thank you. Thank you to all of you who have made it a priority to be here today. You're here because you care about your community and you are, like I, searching for solutions at the very, for the very complex forest management issues that we face. So you're all to be commended for taking a day out of your hunting season and a Saturday afternoon to be here. I want to start with a few um, words about why we're here. Why are we here? We're here because a group of concerned citizens pooled their resources and brought one of the unequivocal experts in her field to give us this most valuable workshop. I'm sure that you will find it a very um, good use of your day. And I want to thank those sponsors now. We would like to thank the Advancing Conservatism Society, John and Donna Gibney, Don, Danya and Warren Kingdon, Ray and Sherry Diekman, r, &R Connor Aviation and Helicopter Logging, a new group founded by Gary Tink Sanders, Stop the Spread of Wildfires, the individual members of the North Valley Pachyderms Club, Ed Hackett, James Butterbaugh, Amy Fox, John Keller of Salmon, Idaho, and special thanks goes to Dan Browning of Rain Dancer Video. He will be our professional videographer for the day. And we do have a very special guest of honor today that I want to recognize right now. And that is Mrs. Nancy Graham. Where is Nancy? There she is. Nancy Graham is Karen Bud Fallon's teacher from high school in Wyoming. She called me and she was so excited. She's like, I can't, I can't believe that a young woman that I taught has accomplished so much and I want to be there to see her and, and hear her speak. So that's really, really exciting. Okay, we're going to cover some ground rules and a little bit on the agenda how the agenda is going to lay out today. So first of all, please uh, take out your cell phones and turn them off if you haven't done that. I'm going to do the same because I um, pretty consistently forget. And in the legislature, that means we have to buy donuts for everybody if our phone rings. <laughs> Bathrooms. Bathrooms are not easy to find in this facility. But if you go out the door and go all the way to the right, that's the gentlemen's are down on this end. And the ladies are down on this end. Okay? So that's the bathrooms. All right. A little bit about our agenda for today. Karen uh, speaks off the cuff with her presentation. She won't have any particular slides. Um, she will be speaking on the issues of uh, building a land use plan, and she's going to describe that to you in detail. We will be specifically covering the processes of collaboration coordination and consistency reviews. Each of those has its own process that she will be describing to you. This presentation is, is um, specifically geared for local governments. Uh, but again, um, you're here because you care about your community, so you are to be commended. And let's just give you a round of applause for being here. Um, I think at about 11.30, we're going to break for, uh, we're going to give Karen a break from speaking, and we're going to take some question and answers until noon. At noon, we'll break for lunch. You're on your own for lunch. We're within about two blocks of several lovely restaurants. We have River Rising and the Backdoor Deli that's within walking distance, and we're probably going to need a little exercise about that time, so I'd encourage you to get out and do that. We'll take an hour for lunch and start back about 1 o'clock. Um, Karen will present from 1 to 2.30, and then we'll have another half an hour of question and answers. And at this time, I'd like to ask if we have any elected officials in the room, if you would please stand. Okay, awesome. Again. This presentation is specifically geared for elected officials and local governments, so you will be given priority with your questions. Okay? I hope everybody can 
accept that, okay. Um, all right, let's see. And uh, at 3 o'clock, we will then open the mics for, for public comment. And that is a courtesy to those of you who wish to public comment. It's not something that we are required to do, but we do value your opinions. We are um, in full support of your First Amendment right and your freedom of speech and your freedom to associate. And uh, we appreciate civil discourse. Um, that said, I do need to lay the ground rules and let you know that um, uh, you're welcome to ask any question that you have for Karen. She's already agreed that she will answer any question that you have. But uh, outbursts or disruptions will not be tolerated. This is, a, this is your only warning that you're going to get. We're going to have a zero tolerance policy on outbursts and interruptions. If you choose to do that, you will be asked to leave. The police will be called and you will be escorted out. So just so we have that laid out in front, we have absolutely no problem with the people who are protesting outside as long as they are civil. Okay? All right. Okay, so why are we here? We are here because we all want healthy air, clean water, wildlife, abundant outdoor recreation, and safe, vibrant communities. But nearly everyone in Montana knows that the federal policies enacted by distant politicians in Washington, D.C. are producing very poor results. And anybody who spent the summer here last summer, I think, can agree with that statement. We are here because we find the unhealthy air quality and the economic devastation created by the lack of proper management unacceptable. And at this point, we don't care who owns the land. We just want it properly managed. We are here because the Environmental Quality Council on which I serve found that 22,000 miles of the 32,000 miles of roads on United States Forest Service lands have now been closed to multiple use. True statement. The federal government has cut off way too much access that should be left available for recreation, initial attack firefighting, search and rescue, and resource management. We are here because we know that we must implement significant reforms to responsibly reduce wildfire threats, protect our environment, enhance our hunting opportunities, revive our economy, and keep access to public lands open. Now a little bit about why we are not here. We're going to handle that 800 pound gorilla in the room right now. We will be evaluating policies that govern the United States Forest Service. But we know that there are many good people who work or contract for the United States Forest Service. And we need to separate the people from the policies. I don't want any people attacked. But we are going to review the policies of the United States Forest Service. And we we so appreciate our firefighters who, who put themselves in harm's way when everybody else is running out, they're the ones running in. Do we have any firefighters in the room? Thank you for what you do, and you do so regardless of the policies put before you. Thank you. Regardless of what you might have heard put forth in the media or in letters to the editor, this is not about land transfer. <laughs> it simply isn't. The first time Karen and I spoke about the land transfer issue was yesterday in the car after I'd picked her up at the airport on our way home. I said, you can't believe what they're doing. They're trying to make this, steal the narrative and make this about the lands transfer issue. And it is simply not. It is absolutely not about the lands transfer issue. But since they have chosen 
to organize a protest and write letters to the editor and disseminate misinformation, we're going to tackle that issue right now. I've learned a lot since I've been in the legislature, and some of the things I wish I wouldn't have had to learn because they're not based in truth and facts. They're based in fabrication and political theater. And there's a lot of political theater out there. And we're going to reveal some of that to you right now. Democrats and green decoy groups like to say that if the land is transferred to the state, we would sell off the public land to the highest bidder. That is a patently false claim. For over 100 years, Montana has managed 6 million acres of state-owned public lands, and we have done a very good job of it. We protect the environment, prevent wildfires, produce valuable commodities, and provide jobs and revenues for public services, and we outperform the federal government economically at a rate of about 5 to 1. And that's a proven fact. You can check it out. The, the studies are readily available. Last session, this is the session 2015, I supported uh, Senate Bill 274, Senate Bill 215. They were both designed to ensure that public lands are kept public. And we're going to go into depth and review those in just a moment. Okay? I also supported House Bill 496 who was, that was brought forth by Representative Kerry White. That was a feasibility study just to assign a task force to the issue of studying the issue of transferring the public lands. And what would it look like? And how would we go about an orderly transfer? We're not silly enough to think that we could just assume responsibility for all the 74% of the public lands in River Valley County and the 6 million acres across the state of Montana. But with a little bit of thought and study, we could certainly organize ourselves into what, how we could go about doing it so that we could be more effective in our management of public lands. So how many people have heard the old saying, if you tell a lie often enough, it becomes the truth? Okay, That's what we have had happen here with this issue of public lands. No one, has, no one that I know of has ever wanted to transfer the public lands for the purpose of selling them off to the highest bidder. That is a complete and total lie. They have successfully stolen the narrative, and we have not done nearly enough to combat that. So at this time, I'm going to show you, we're going to take a few minutes and show you a qu quick, um, some video slides here to address it. And at this time, I'd like to ask Senator Fielder to come up, and she's going to run us through those slides. Senator Fielder brought these bills, and she... Okay, it's just going to take a minute to warm up. Okay, can we do... Thank, thank you, Representative Manzella. How about Representative Manzella? She just takes the bull by the horns. Uh, she's fantastic. It's a pleasure to serve with her and Representative White, uh, Carrie White from Bozeman as well is here today. Uh, my name is Jennifer Fielder. I, I serve uh, in the state senate from northwest Montana. And it's true, I care about our public lands. I, I care deeply. We're surrounded by them and they affect our lives and our livelihoods and our enjoyments on a regular basis. And um, what you see outside are probably a lot of people who really care about our public lands also. But unfortunately, um, they're receiving information from what is being termed green decoys, camouflaged activists that are being funded by uh, dark money groups from the left side of the political spectrum. 
And as this headline shows, uh, public land debate marred by camouflaged activists. Anytime we start talking about ways to better manage our public lands, they start telling everyone it's all about selling it off, which is absolutely not true. Um, this is a flyer from a rally that they staged in the state capitol during the 2015 session. And this flyer was sent out after I had introduced legislation to actually keep our public lands public. And this was the front side of it. And then the back side of it, it's a little hard for you to read from a distance here. But I'll just highlight it. It says, a radical group of legislators want to evict us from our public lands. They want to push their agenda of transferring public lands to the state so they can be sold off to the highest bidder. That was in response to legislation I introduced to actually keep public lands public and to find better ways to manage the public lands better. And uh, you'll see the actual legislation here. This is Senate Bill 274. This is a copy of the, the bill. This is the title of the bill, a bill for an act entitled, an act prohibiting the sale of federal land in Montana. Now, in Montana, we're different than Congress. Our bills, when we have a title, the legislation can only do what's in that title. It can't do all these other things that you see being snuck into legislation at the federal level. So that is it. It's, that's the bill, basically a one-page bill. This one here, Senate Bill 274, would actually prohibit the federal government from selling public land in Montana. And that one was tabled in committee um, after... Uh, staunch opposition from the organizers of the rally that you see outside who were claiming to want to keep public land public. Those organizers came and testified against the bill that would have kept it public. We had another bill, uh, House Bill 496. This one was brought by Representative White, and this was to create a public land task force to study the management responsibility for public land administered by the um, Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management and try to find ways for improving management of those public lands, maybe look at some pilot areas that we could look at doing some things different than what's being done now. Um, but it was going to be a, a equally bipartisan task force to just study the issue. That was supported by the legislature, but when it got to Governor Steve Bullock's desk, he vetoed it. Uh, Senate Bill 215 is another bill that I introduced, and this one said that it was an act prohibiting future sales of land granted or transferred to the state of Montana from the federal government. So in other words, in any land that would be transferred in the future from the federal government to Montana, the state would be prohibited from selling it. A very, very simple bill, Senate Bill 215. I introduced that bill, and uh, you can see the title there. Again, a very narrow title. That bill was also tabled in committee, which means that enough people in committee voted against even bringing it forward for discussion to allow the discussion to happen, to allow it to work through the process. Again, that bill was opposed by the organizers of the rally outside uh, the so-called Keep It Public movement uh, came in and testified against the bill that would keep it public. Um, after that bill was um, killed um, by primarily Democrat legislators and their supporters in committee, um, the Democrat Party for the state of Montana sent out a email uh, poll to voters. And um, the copy of the poll is right here. And it, well, actually says the results from Friday are in, from the poll are in. Almost 1,000 people voted, and the winner of the worst bill of the session goes to, hey, Senate Bill 215, Senator Fielder, the one that would keep it public. And what they said is Senate Bill 215, Senator Field, Jennifer Fielder's bill to transfer and sell Montana's public lands. You see what's going on? Okay. Now, I hope that some of us can communicate with our friends that are in, part of, in, in the crowd outside, those of us that have friends that believe the lands are going to be sold. You need to let them know. They've been duped, and it's not about that. And if they really care about public lands, we should be working together on solving the issues with our public lands, which is what we're here to do today. Why the lie? Well, the follow-up paragraph on that, and it's, it's highlighted, it's actually in a light blue, it's not showing up on the screen too well, but what it says is, will you help us kick Senator Fielder out of office and elect pro-public lands Democrats in 2016? That's what it's about. That's what that's about out there, is blocking Republicans from being elected and being successful. Um, in truth, the Montana Constitution already protects our public lands. Um, there's been federal land transferred to the state many times in the past. I just want to point this out. The Montana Constitution, Article 10, Education and Public Lands, Section 11, Public Land Trust Disposition. All lands of the state that have been or may be granted by Congress 
or acquired by gift or grant or device from any person or corporation shall be public lands of the state. They shall be held in trust for the people for the respective purposes for which they have been or may be granted. So the state constitution already protects these lands from being uh, randomly sold off and that type of thing. So um, what you see outside is based on uh, untruth and outright deception, and unfortunately some people are falling for that, and they're getting very worked up about it, as I would too if I believed it. So please help them to understand that um, what the Keep It Public movement is not being truthful with them. And any time there's a discussion about better public land management and ways to find better public ma land management, they start saying that it's about selling off all the lands and trying to get people worked up to protest. And that's why they're out there, because that's what they think we're here for today, is to sell off all the public lands. That's what they've been told, which you will find is not the case. So just thank you, Representative Manzella, for letting me clear the air on that. Oh, um, let's see if it comes up. Uh, who spun the tr uh, who spun the miss? Um, go to www.greendecoys.org if you want to know who spun the myths and where it's coming from. And uh, there is a video, and we'll see if it plays. I don't know. Did it play? Okay. You need to hit play on there. This is a short three-minute video from one of the hearings, so you can see for yourself uh, what I'm saying is is true about who came and protested or or. Um, you know, uh, asked us to vote no on the keep it public bills and then held the rally to keep it public. There's no question in my mind that most of us agree that the public lands should remain public. So this bill would place into statute the uh, prohibition against the state selling any public lands that may be transferred from the federal government to the state of Montana in the future. There's actually been quite a debate about the transfer of public lands and, and um, a lot of the um, debate has revolved around a assertion that the state would just sell the lands off. So this, this bill, I think, um, exercises our voice as the representatives of the people of Montana that we do not want to let that happen that we want to make sure that public lands are kept public. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Clayton Elliott, E-L-L-I-O-T-T. -T. I'm here today representing the members of the Montana Wilderness Association. Unfortunately, we rise to oppose Senate Bill 215 today. Mr. Chairman and uh, committee members, my name is Nick G. Bach. That's G-E-V as in Victor, O-C-K. And I'm here on behalf of the Montana Wildlife Federation. We rise in opposition to this. My name is Jake Troyer, and I'm here to represent the over 5,200 members of Montana Audubon. We uh, urge do not pass on Senate Bill 215. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Ben Lamb, and I am representing the National Wildlife Federation. Um, just a hearty me too from us. This is a simple bill. It prohibits the state from selling any land that may be transferred to it from the federal government in the future puts that in statute. Now, if you believe in keeping public lands public, you should support this bill. I am quite surprised that the Montana Wilderness Association, the Montana Audubon Association, and the Montana Wildlife Federation, who are sponsoring a rally in this capital a week from today, a rally to keep public lands public, came in today and testified against keeping our public lands in public ownership. For the record, I think that shows that there's some disingenuous information being circula circulated about to scare the people of Montana about this issue. And I, I thought that for sure they would be here supporting this bill today if they did truly believe in keeping public lands public. So there's a conflict there that they're going to have to explain to their memberships and, and to the public uh, next week. Mr. Chairman, the bill is simple. It, it prohibits the sale of any lands that may be transferred to the state in the future.
There you have it, the truth. There's another quote that I like. The truth is like a lion. It needs no defending. Simply set it free and it will defend itself. You have the truth before you now. All of that information is, if you don't believe what you've just seen, it's all available for you to do your own research at uh, leg.mt.gov. All of that information can be found on the state website. Jennifer Fielder is an, an incredibly committed, dedicated, hardworking woman of integrity. And her constituents know that. They've, they've done their best to try to discredit her, um, but they have failed. She, conti she continues to fight for the rights of her citizens. I continue to fight for ours. Um, the truth will set you free. Presenting this truth could very well get me unelected because uh, they're not going to like it much. But you've now had the opportunity to see it. I hope that you'll defend it. All right. Back to why we're here. <laughs> Again, this wasn't why we're here. We were here to talk about the transfer of federal lands. The Montana Department of Environmental Quali Quality lists premature mortality as a health risk associated with breathing wildfire smoke. This summer, Ravalli County spent 34 days in some level of health compromising air quality conditions. Scientists estimate that fires in the continental U.S. and Alaska release 44 metric tons of mercury into the atmosphere every year. And that's only one of the many chemicals, gases, and carcinogens released in the, into the atmosphere during fires. Representative Carrie White does an excellent presentation on the health effects of wildfire smoke. And it's downright scary what we're breathing. And, what we're, and the mercury that goes into the air falls to the water, and if we're not breathing it, we're drinking it. Article 2, Section 3 of our state constitution that I take an oath to uphold gives us an inalienable right to a clean and healthful environment. Our county commissioners' first and foremost responsibility is to the health and welfare of our citizens who live in the counties they serve. Again, we spent 34 days in some sort of unhealthy air quality last, just last summer. We're here because Montanans are desperate for solutions to the forest management problems we face in our beautiful treasure state. And more accurately, we're dying for lack of solutions. And what's more important than that is we're all in this together. If this is not a partisan issue. This is not a Democrat and Republican issue. We all breathe the same air. We're all in this together and we all should be working together to find solutions. Of the 1.2 million acres burned in Montana's fire season in 2017, more than 1 million of those were on federally managed lands. 74% of River Valley County consists of lands that are federally management. Proper management of the federal lands is quite obviously where our problems lie and where our solutions must be found. Representative Jean Forte has put forth a resilient Federal Forest Act of 2017. It has now passed the House and it is on to the Senate. We hope that it will find its way to the President's desk and that we will um, receive some solutions from that effort. But we can't wait for the, the White Knight and the heroes to come save us. We've got to be our own heroes. We've got to be finding the solutions we seek. We need to know what our tools are that are available to us as citizens and as local governments. And we need to take a, a, a good inventory of those tools and we know how to properly use those tools. And that's why we're here today, to learn to better use the tools that are afforded to us. Karen Bud Fallon is a fifth generation Wyoming rancher and she is currently awaiting presidential appointment to the BLM director's position. She is very deeply skilled in understanding federal law 
and has successfully defended property owners against federal overreach. She specializes in natural resources law and does these workshops regularly directed at assisting local governments to more effectively interface with federal agencies in order to protect the citizens they represent. We are honored to have Karen Bedfallon here for the purposes of this workshop. And again, we thank our group of citizens who made this possible. And without further ado, I give you Karen Bud Fallon. Can't believe that my high school home ec teacher is here. <laughs> and I'll bet she can't believe, because I was kind of, I wouldn't say I was shy, but I was definitely not in the in crowd in high school. I bet she can't believe I'm standing up here. And I want you to know that my kids hated your husband. <laughs> Her husband was my English teacher, and if you got a comma wrong on a Mr. Graham test, he would just beat you to death. So I learned commas. <laughs> and so then when I'd read my kids' stuff, I'd be circling commas and yelling at them, and they were just like, mother. So my kids were not especially fans of Mr. Graham, but I was. I learned how to write a sentence in his class, and I will be forever grateful as an attorney <laughs> for that class. So this is, I mean, I just think that's really cool. Um, my notes dropped, give me a second. <laughs> I am really glad to be here to visit with you all today. Um, I, I have to tell you, what I read in the Missoulian and what I've read in all the papers I think is kind of funny. I mean, people get so wound up. Um, I, I'm trained as an attorney. So my world is the rule of law. That's what we're here to talk about. Um, I don't get, a, I mean, I have, certainly have political opinions, which I share with my husband and my children all the time. But the courtroom doesn't have any place for political opinions. I'm leaving that to your fine senators and representatives that are here. So what we want to talk about is what can you do as a local government under the rule of law to have more influence on federal land management decisions. And federal law grants you some tools. Now let me tell you what federal law does not do, because people, people sort of get all wound up about what they think, words like coordination and collaborative and cooperating agency. They, people get all fuzzed up over these C words, and, and so let me tell you kind of what they don't do, and then let's talk about what they do do. They do not give a local government veto power over the federal agency. You cannot go to the Forest Service and say, you will cut this tree, and you will cut this tree, and you will graze a cow on this acre. You don't have that authority, so don't go there because you don't have that legal authority under the federal statutes. So it's not veto power. It's not zoning. Local governments do not have the authority to zone the federal land. Period. Okay? This is not a jobs versus the environment argument. I hear people make that argument all the time. Well, if you want to protect the environment, we have to not manage the land. That is just not the way it works. I got interested in the law as a kid growing up in Big Piney, Wyoming. I grew up on, as a fifth generation rancher west of Big Piney. For those of you that don't know where Big Piney is, it's about 150 miles south of Jackson, 150 miles north of Rock Springs. And growing up, my dad was really involved. And he was I mean, you think that I am I'm loud and forceful. I pale in comparison to my father. 
And so he was always going to meetings on this or that, and he was always listening to arguments. And I remember one time going to a meeting with him in Pinedale, which was the county seat in Sublette County where I grew up, and I kid you not, it was a presentation by a group of environmentalists to the Forest Service, and they were trying to shut down our grazing allotment on the Bridger Teton National Forest 150 miles away because they were convinced that livestock grazing was harming the geysers in Yellowstone. <laughs> I, I'm not, I, rem, I mean, I remember that. I'm, I was sitting in the jury box. I think that's kind of where I got the idea to be a lawyer. I mean, it was really cool because it was at the courthouse, and my sisters and I are sitting at the jury box, and they are talking about how we, we need to reduce livestock grazing because of the geysers in Yellowstone, and I'm just thinking, you got to be kidding me. You know, we've been grazing cattle on that land for five generations. I'm the fifth generation to live in that house. Surely, if our livestock grazing on the National Forest was harming the geysers, they'd have had a problem four generations ago. So it didn't make any sense to me that this was a whole jobs versus the environment kind of argument, and I don't think that's what this is. I don't think being involved with the federal agencies and making the decisions is a Republican versus Democrat issue. People try to make this out as some sort of a white wing conspiracy or some sort of a left wing argument. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about federal statutes that grant local governments additional opportunity to have influence on federal decisions. It's not a partisan issue. It's a participation issue. So with that sort of understanding of what local involvement is not, let's talk about what it is. And I'm going to direct my comments on two important federal statutes. One of them is the National Environmental Policy Act. The National Environmental Policy Act was adopted in 1969. It's actually a really short statute, pretty easy to read if you want to read it sometime. And what it directs the federal agencies to do is to consider the impacts of the environment on their decisions. And if there is an environmental impact for a federal agency decision, NEPA says, that the federal government has to consider the local, what people all now call custom and culture, which is you guys, and the local environment, or I mean, excuse me, the local economics. The courts have said over and over that NEPA does not direct an outcome. It's a look before you leap statute. Now I understand that NEPA has been abused and abused over the years, but I'm going back to the actual statutory requirements of NEPA. So you've got NEPA saying, protect, consider the environment, consider the economics, consider local custom and culture. NEPA, though, also has a requirement in that for what they call consistency review. And consistency review under NEPA says that if a local land or resource management plan is placed from a local government, which I'll define in a minute, that the federal agencies are required to consider that local land use plan and to be as consistent as practical so long as the local land use plan does not violate federal law. Okay? So let's kind of break down that consistency review requirement. Consistency review number one requires a written local land use plan or policy. Now people get for one thing, when people hear land use plan, they get all nervous that we're talking about zoning of private lands. Doesn't have anything to do with zoning of private lands. A federal statute cannot authorize zoning of private lands. So if you don't like your zoning statutes, talk to your legislators. This isn't the federal government at all. 
when the federal statute, when NEPA talks about a local plan or policy, what it's talking about is a document that describes the three things in NEPA that the federal agencies have to consider. Consider the environment, consider custom and culture, consider the tax base. That's what part of your local land use plan or policy, or I think in Ravalli County, you guys call that your natural resources policy, okay? It's interesting thing. When you look at the federal statutes and you look at the case law, these federal statutes, the federal agencies don't really care whether it's a policy or a plan or whatever. I mean, you can call it, you can call it a framework. You can call it whatever you all feel like calling it. That part doesn't make any difference. But it's what the local government wants to see happen as desired future condition for any, quote, major federal action significantly affecting the quality of the human environment, which basically the courts have said is any time this federal government spends a dollar, it's got to comply with NEPA. So what we're doing is we're looking at these land use plans by the local governments or local natural resource policies, or I, I think in Montana somebody said they call them growth management, growth policies. Federal government doesn't care what you call it. But you're looking at a document that says this is the local environment and this is what we like as our desired future condition. This is the local tax base. This is how we are making money or how the local economy is dependent on the federal lands. This is the local custom and culture. This is who the people are. A lot of times you're looking at local custom and culture is who are the people that lived here? You know, who's the first guy that showed up here in the Bitterroot Valley and what did he do? And who was the second guy that showed up? And how is it that the citizens feel about access or recreation or whatever issues are important to you? You can't do this as a cookie cutter. I can tell you that the people in Teton County, Wyoming, which is where Jackson is, is going to have a whole different custom and culture than you guys. And that's okay. Because we're talking about something that's local to you. The other thing that the federal government cares about is it has to be a local government. And a local government is defined as a locally elected body from a general ballot. So like county commissions, soil and water conservation districts, those are local governments. Um, it can't be just like an irrigation board that you irrigate, you know, that are elected from like district members. That doesn't count. It's got to be somebody on the generally elected ballot. So normally we talk about county commissions and conservation districts. So as you're looking at your land use plan, what you're doing for a consistency review is you're, you're your local government is preparing this document that describes the three things I talked about. And then you're presenting that to the federal agencies for a consistency review requirements. Now, consistency review is different than public comment. And we just finished a land use plan in Oregon, so I think people, I, I'm mentioning this because people were mixed up in Oregon about, about what this different was. You're the public, as members of the public, you absolutely have the ability, and I would encourage you to absolutely present public comments. The difference is the federal agency doesn't have to respond to you. Okay? They take your public comment, and they read it with everybody else's public comment. People from Bozeman or Missoula or Omaha or Cheyenne or New York City or whatever the deal is. And they consider public comments when they're making a decision. As part of a consistency review, the federal agency actually has to come back to the local government and say, this is where our decision is going to conflict with your local land use plan or policy, and here is why. They, owe, they have to give you that explanation under a consistency review. 
So it's a dialogue. So then as a local government, you could go back to the federal agency and say, well, yeah, but did you consider this option? Or did you look at here? Or how can we try to be consistent with your agency action versus, versus our local land use plan and policy? So consistency review forces that dialogue. And it's something in federal statute. It's, we don't have to have Congress give us this right. The federal statutes give us this right. Now, one of the things that I hear people say, and I want to correct this misunderstanding, is people think that what they're doing is forcing a federal agency to comply with state or local law. Can't do that. The Constitution doesn't require that. The Constitution sets up a federal system that doesn't require federal government to follow state and local law. So that's not what you're doing. So if you think that's what this local land use plan is, that's incorrect. It's the federal statute that says federal agencies have to do a consistency review. It's not your local land use plan. I think another thing that people get kind of confused about is they, is they think that, that these local land use plans are sort of a way to go in and throw it on the agency's desk and you say, you will comply with this. I think what NEPA was really getting at, and when you look at the language of the National Environmental Policy Act and the regulations implementing it, what they were trying to do was they were trying to build a dialogue. Like I have this great husband. My husband's six foot five. I can tell you that if he and I have a dialogue about what he's supposed to do, he makes a way better decision than if he just says it himself. I have C women in this room <laughs> kind of agreeing with me. I see husbands looking at you. My husband looks at me weird every time I say that, but it is the truth. It's the dialogue that we need to have. And the federal statutes require that dialogue through a consistency review. Now the other piece of NEPA says that, that local governments can also be cooperating agencies. And I've heard people get all worried about being a cooperating agency, and I don't agree with that concern. The first thing is, is that a cooperating agency is a tool in the toolbox. Being a cooperating agency on every federal decision is going to be incredibly time consuming for whatever poor county official or whatever citizens committee is going to do it. I mean, you can't, it's, it's impossible to do that. Being a cooperating agency allows you to participate in the ID team with the federal agencies prior to a draft decision being issued. There may be cases, there may be decisions, that's a good thing. There may be cases that you don't want to do it. I think people sort of think that if the federal agency is given a choice, they'll pick one over the other. Guess what? It's not the federal agency's choice. It's the local government's choice about how they want to participate in any given decision. And I think the local governments ought to have every tool in the toolbox and look at the decision and figure out, how do we want to participate? Do we want to look at a consistency review because it fits within our local natural resources plan? Do we want to be a cooperating agency and participate all the way along on the ID team? Do we want to do coordination, which I'll get to in a minute, because actually coordination is not part of NEPA, it's part of National Forest Management Act. What is it we want to do? I think local governments need to have the whole gamut and then they get to choose. So this isn't a matter of you got to pick one over the other or one is better than the other. It's a matter of what's going to work best in whatever situation I'm talking about. I think people also are concerned I've, because they think to be a cooperating agency you got to spend a whole ton of money or I've, I've 
heard the complaint that you have to sign a memorandum of understanding. There's no federal requirement for the local government to sign a memorandum of understanding to be a cooperating agency. But I've read MOUs that I thought were actually really good. Because they said the local government is going to do X, Y, and Z, and the federal agency is going to do A, B, and C, or whatever it says. But they're negotiated agreements. And if you don't like the way the negotiation is going, don't sign the agreement. There's no statute that says you have to sign an agreement you don't like. So the whole idea that you've got to, you know, fall into this big federal trap and the, the government's trying to, try, is going to force you to do things, the federal statutes don't require that. And I think one of the mistakes that people often make is you, is you forget to go back and you say, what is the underlying federal statute? What does it actually require? And once you understand what the statute actually requires, then you can maneuver within that whatever works best for your local government. Now, to be a cooperating agency, you have to have two qualifications. Number one, it has to be a local government. Citizens groups, citizens committees, um, cattlemen's groups, timber users, you're not a local government. You cannot be a cooperating agency statute or cooperating agency. Number two, your, your area of expertise is defined by state law, not by federal law. So look at, at the county commission's statutory requirements. Your county commissioners are there to protect the health, wealth, and safety of the citizens. I got to see Carrie's presentation last night about what you guys have to suffer through being in 30 days of a smoke-filled canyon. I mean, that's the health of the citizens. Your state statute said you guys are supposed to be dealing with that. That gives you special expertise to participate with the federal agencies in these decisions. One of the things that the local governments are supposed to do is kind of protect the tax base. I mean, local governments are the ones that have got to figure out how to keep the roads open and how to pay for county services and pay for, um, you know, emergency services or what, you know, whatever your county takes care of. That's the economic viability of the county. That's why when you're looking at county governments, I think you need to understand what is your economic base and how do you protect that base so that you can continue to provide services to your county. How are you going to afford this? How are you going to afford, I mean, I, I don't know much about your economic base, but in Wyoming, for example, the counties are, re, um, are required to keep senior citizen centers open. So in Sublette County, Wyoming, who's going to pay to keep the Senior Citizen Center open and the emergency services open and pay for the, the county sheriffs? That's why the economic base is so important. That's your expertise as part of a cooperating agency. And if you want to take that back to your local land use plan or your natural resources policy, I think you need to include that as part of your policy. And not just a sentence that says, we want to protect the economics in Ravalli County. I mean, I think that's a really nice sentiment. But you've got to understand, I'm, and I've been a lawyer for 30 years. I look at everything as what, if I'm going to stand up in front of a federal judge, what am I going to argue? And if I'm representing a county and I am standing up in front of a federal judge that's, and I say, they're violating our policy by not protecting the economy and that's all it says, and a federal judge is going to say, well, they say they are, and I'm going to defer to the agency because they have the data, you guys got nothing, and I'm going to lose. So I think when you're talking about your economic policies in your local land use plan, you got to say, Who's paying the taxes? What kind of jobs do they have? We're doing these, um, 
I gotta tell you, Wyoming doesn't have a big timber industry at all. So what I know is cows. And it, I, I mean, I like cows. I think cows are really cool. And I can tell you that for counties in Wyoming, if the BLM or the Forest Service reduces AUMs, I can tell you what that's going to cost the county. The, the st that studies and information is out there. That's the kind of stuff you ought to have in your local natural resources. I mean, it can't be, I'm going to graze, you have to graze a cow on this allotment, this acre, this acre, and this acre. You can't go that far, but you can say, if AUMs are reduced in my county by by, you know, 200 or 300, it's going to cost the county whatever that number is. That's the kind of stuff we need to be giving to the federal agencies so that when they do their analysis, they got something legitimate to do the analysis with. I gotta tell you, one of my big gripes when I read National Environmental Policy Act documents is reading the Custom and Culture and Economic section. Because so often what the agencies do is they don't have the manpower and the expertise in the local district to do it, so they contract it out. You should read what a guy in Pennsylvania thinks is custom and culture in the economic base in Sublette County, Wyoming. It's not right. And it's because some guy in Pennsylvania doesn't know. I tell this story all the time, but I think this is so illustrative of what I'm talking about. So I graduate, get out of undergrad school, all right? 23, I've lived in Sublette County, and I've lived in Laramie, Wyoming, where I got my undergraduate degree, okay? Not especially large places. And I got, I fell into this, I, it was the luckiest thing in the world. I got to go back to Washington, D.C., and worked for a guy named Jim Watt, who was Secretary of the Interior under Ronald Reagan. Okay, so imagine this 23-year-old blonde kid leaving Wyoming, going to D.C. I mean, it was, it was culture shock. Okay, so I get my first assignment is to help Department of Interior, because that time they were talking about grazing fees and whether they ought to keep the PREA formula or whether we ought to look at something else, okay? And so, so I'm sharing an office with this guy, and he was a really, really cool guy. He, got, he had grown up in Cleveland, and he was like the, a true success, American success story, okay? So he grows up in Cleveland in poverty. He's really smart, and he's really big. So he gets out of high school, and he gets a football scholarship, and he goes to, I don't know, whatever university it was on a football scholarship, gets out of there, decides to go to law school, graduates like number six or number seven in his class in law school, and gets hired on the honors program, which is where the federal government only hires the top third percent of the lawyers, law school graduating classes in the nation, and so now he's working at Department of Interior, and he and I are assigned to go through all these public comments on the grazing fee. All right, now remember, the guy has grown up in Cleveland. And the guy has never been west of Cleveland. <laughs> okay, so I go to Interior, and I am so proud of being from Wyoming. And so I immediately, on my part of the office, I put up a map, and I put a star on the ranch, and I'm talking about the ranch, and growing up on the ranch, and this guy said, well, how big is your ranch? And I told him, and he was like, is that all the land in Wyoming? Uh, uh, no. And so then, he, I mean, he was totally blown away that in Wyoming, we talk about acres per cow instead of cows per acre. And he says, well, why is it? I said, well, it's, it, I said, it's because we have very little moisture and we lot, rely on sun, snow mountain. So I'm explaining all this to him. The guy thought I was from Mars. <laughs> and so this is a guy who is really, really smart, and he's writing the grazing fee formula. And we're trying to come up with an economic value for the grazing fee formula. I mean, the guy thought I had lost my mind because he didn't have any concept. And I'm 
not saying he was a bad guy. I'm saying he didn't have a clue. <laughs> so as part of your, so am I'm the Forest Service now, and I'm going to hire an economic analysis from a guy in Pennsylvania to come write it about Ravalli County. I don't think you're going to have the same trouble as I did with my office mate talking about what the ranch was like in Wyoming. I think in your local land use plan, you ought to have that kind of specific information so that the agency's got a place to go. And if they choose to do the contractor somewhere, that is great, but then you've got, instead of just saying, oh, I think that's wrong for a service, go do it again, you got a way to show them and say, this is why it's wrong. Here is our information. And if Forest Service still says you're wrong, then at least you're giving your lawyer a shot at going to federal district court and saying, look, Your Honor, here's the real data. This is what they're doing. Make the Forest Service go start over. But if you just have these general policies about protect the economics in Valley County. Thank you. <laughs> he said you're screwed. <laughs> That's a legal term, you know. So you need to be putting that stuff in there. The custom and culture sections, I think, are even funnier. You read a custom and culture section in the EIS written by somebody in Pennsylvania, and actually I'm sure they have really good, I'm not picking on Pennsylvania, I'm sure they have really great people in Pennsylvania, but I don't think they have any clue about what it's like living in this little skinny valley between these two huge mountains and trying to do your economic development in this little skinny valley. I'm just, just my guess. <clears throat> so your land use plan needs that in there. It needs a, a true discussion of what your custom and culture is. And last night I had dinner with Susie, a whole bunch of people, but I was sitting next to Susie Foss, and she's telling me that her son is a fly fishing person. And that that, that kind of recreation in this area is a really big deal. Which is really cool, because I couldn't cast a fly line if my life depended on it. But she was talking about how, how the recreational fishing is really going down because you've got these catastrophic fires and you've got now the rain and it's carrying all this silt and gunk and horrible stuff into these rivers and it's cooking the fish. So not only is that harming your economics, but it's harming the custom and culture because I'm guessing that most of the people live here really like this kind of outdoor activity stuff. Otherwise, you'd be living in Bozeman, or Pennsylvania. <laughs> See, now, you're, now I'm gonna get hate mail from people in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I don't want, I, I don't, I'm, I'm you have no idea how careful you have to be now. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard. <laughs> but you're the ones that have got to define that stuff. Because if you don't define it, it's going to get defined by somebody else, and they may not be right. Now, one of the other things that NEPA requires is the development of alternatives. And I think, I, I think that as local governments, we are not near de as involved in the development of alternatives as we ought to be. In fact, most of the time, we just let the agency develop the alternatives, and then we gripe about them when we don't like them. You know, one of the things that I've seen local governments do now is develop a local government alternative. They actually participate as a cooperating agency, and when they start talking about alternative development, the, al the local government will do their own thing. I, I know that you guys have got sage grouse in Montana. That's a really hot topic now. I worked with counties in Oregon 
to actually develop our own sage grouse alternative, which we presented in the Oregon ROD, the record of decision for the BLM land use plan. I think we ought to be doing that. I think we ought to be taking active involvement in actually doing these documents. Because I think you're going to get better documents. And if you get better documents, you're going to get better decisions. I'm trying, I'm looking at my watch here. I think I'll, I think I will talk about coordination and then, then we can take a break and then we can kind of talk about some of the other stuff later. But let me talk about coordination because that's another one of those C words. The National Forest Management Act for Forest Service as well as the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, which is BLM, says that the federal agencies will quote, coordinate with local governments. I think that's fabulous. Guess what? There is not a single definition in federal law of what coordination is. Okay? So I'm all for it, but there's nothing that defines it. When you look at some of the case law, and when you look at at least where some of the regulations are going, what coordination basically is is government to government relationship. But one of the areas I think that local governments often miss is they say, we're going to coordinate with the Forest Service. And then you never once say how you're going to do this. So when I talk to people about drafting local land use plans and policies, I tell them, define coordination. For example, coordination number one has got to be the local government sending out its local land use plan or policy to all of the federal agencies. I hate to tell you guys, it's not the federal agency's duty to come and dig around in your documents and try to find a local land use plan. In fact, FLIPMA says, which does apply to the Forest Service in certain situations, FLIPMA says that if, they're, if the local government has not informed the federal agency about a local land use plan, the federal agency is violating no law by totally ignoring it. So, it, so the counties or the conservation districts have got to make the move first. So I tell them, put it in your land use plan. Say, 30 days after the adoption or the amendment of our plan or policy or whatever you're going to call it, we are going to forward this document to all of the federal agencies. Then I say, OK, now you need something in there about public involvement. And so what I tell them is, is what you ought to do is write a letter to all the agencies and say, we meet on the, you know, third Tuesday of every month and we are giving you an open invitation to attend any meeting and we will give you space on the agenda. And sometimes they'll come and sometimes they won't and sometimes they have something to talk about and sometimes they don't. But at least you're giving them the space and I do it in writing. I mean, as I said, I'm a litigator. I'm looking at what I have to have. The agency's totally blowing me off. And you've got to have stuff in writing, so make that in writing. I also think that you ought to have, that you ought to make the opportunity to have somebody from the county, whether it's an employee or a commissioner, and I mean, don't violate open meetings law. I'm not talking about that at all. But somebody ought to make the offer to go to the Forest Service, the district ranger's office, you know, once a month or whatever you guys pick, and meet with them. I mean, don't just drag them onto your own turf every time. This is not a war. This is a we're going to build a working relationship with these agencies because you can't have good management without a working relationship. So in my land use plans, when, I, when I'm reviewing it for people, I say, put it in there offer that on the, you know, fourth Tuesday of every other month, or whatever you want to say, we will come to your office and sit down with you and your staff and talk about what we are doing as a county that may impact you. I also think that you ought to make provision to have meetings where 
You can just have frank conversations about the agency. I mean, don't get me wrong. I am a major supporter of the First Amendment. But there are reasons that federal judges do not let the press into mediations. And it's because if you take a position and then you later change your mind, you're going to get hung in the press. That is just the reality. Now, as a local government, I will tell you that you cannot make a final decision without being in an open public meeting. So you can't do that. But you can certainly have, you know, one commissioner. Or, I keep looking at the, this poor staff guy over here. I'm sorry. And he's looking over here. There's no reason at least you can't go have a conversation so that when you get to your public meeting, you've at least got your ducks in a row. And then open it up to public comment. Have people come in. I mean, I, you know, you look at the country. Don't you think there's not near enough dialogue? People aren't talking to each other. Even if you're going to take public comments that, that you don't like, listen to them. You know, you might actually get a different perspective. I don't think that's a bad thing. So have the conversation. But at least I, I put that as what, this is what coordination is to us. Define it, because the federal statutes don't define it. And I think just going and saying, we're going to coordinate, I don't, I mean, I, if I'm advising my client and they get a letter that says you will coordinate, I'm going to tell them I have no idea what that means, and I don't have a federal statute or a regulation to fly back on to say this is what it means. And I will tell you that a lot of this is relationships. And you're going to have some people in the Forest Service that are all for it, and some people that are totally against it. I, I mean, I get that. You're going to have that with your spouse, too. Sometimes he's going to be all for what you're in favor of, and sometimes he is going to be not. I mean, that is how it is. But at least you're opening up the dialogue, and at least you're specifying a dialogue so that you can have these conversations. And I have to tell you, I think that it helps. I have seen counties, I have seen conservation districts open up these dialogues. It's not like an overnight deal. But I absolutely can tell you in 30 years, can you believe I'm that old? Holy cow. I'm looking at Mrs. Graham. <laughs> Knew me when I was 16. That just scares me to death. I mean, I have seen this work. I have seen more agencies go to local governments and saying, I'm really having a hard time getting this through upper management, and upper management is just what it is. As a local government, can you help me su help support this position? Because the guys in Washington, D.C. don't have any idea how many trees there are in Valley County, or whatever the issue is. I've seen it go the other way, where the agency comes up and starts to draft a NEPA document, and they say, you know, how about we just take your economic section and put that into our NEPA document? So what you're trying to do is build a relationship that's already outlined in federal statutes so that you're working together. And the policies that you implement in your local land use plan need to be specific to your county. I mean, I read hundreds of land use plans. I don't write them. I could write policies for Sublette County, Wyoming, because I know what the county is made up of, and I know what it needs. I can't do that for Ravalli County. That's something that you guys have to do. Now, a lot of, of, of small counties say, you know, this all sounds great. We have no money. I get that. Um, a couple of ideas that I've seen work in the past is the appointment of steering committees or subcommittees or whatever you want to call them. 
where the county, it has to be the county commission, they would say, we're going to have six people start drafting a land use plan. It's all got to go through public comment, so it's not like, it, you know, this isn't some big secret deal. The county wants to do that. I would get somebody who's in the ranching industry, in the timber industry, in the recreation industry, in the access, whatever, you know, whatever your county's into, and put them and have them start digging out the information. I've noticed with a lot of, of local land use plans that most of the data for the economic section is somewhere. It's just not all in the same place. So it is a lot of legwork. I will gather all this stuff up and get it in the same place. But that's one of the ways that I think some of the counties are dealing with some of the expense of doing this, is to use the expertise within your county. I will bet that Ravalli County has some kind of historical society. Every county does. Little Sublet County, we got, what, 2,500 people? We got two museums. That's because the Pinedale people and the big piney people don't always get along. <laughs> but you get somebody that knows that history, can gather that up, can talk about why did the first guy get here and what did he do and why did the second guy, what kind of economics did this county build on? Put that together. It's information the federal government has to consider and I believe that if they are have better information, they're going to make better decisions. So I think that's how you, at least some counties are dealing with the expense because they're worried about that. The, the land use plan we did in Oregon, that's exactly how we did it. Is they got a local citizens committee together, they gathered up all the background data, they went to the county commission, the county commission did their appropriate public meetings and public hearings, they did they did policies based on the data. I think you've got to do the data first, then do your policies. I've seen county commissions try to do it the opposite way. The truth is I don't think it works. I think you're better off getting the, the data and information first and then coming up with your policies after that. One of the things that I talked about with some of the people last night is that, I mean, everybody here is talking about the forest, how the forest is managed. And I... And I know that you guys are subject to horrendous wildfires. I mean, there's, that is no surprise. So if you want to look at a way to influence forest management as a local government, like I said, you can't say you're going to cut this tree and you're going to cut this tree and you're going to cut this tree. You don't have the legal authority to do that. You can, though, talk about targeted management. Maybe there are areas that where you've got a watershed that supplies the water for the citizens of Hamilton. Maybe that's where you ought to focus on first. Maybe you've got urban interface issues. Maybe that's an area you focus on first. So in my land use plan, I would put initial efforts need to focus on, I don't know, Middle Piney watershed. That would, that's that's in Sublette County, or whatever, I mean, whatever it is you guys have. We've got, we don't have a lot of trees, so we don't have the urban rural interface, but you guys do. I mean, I've seen lots of trees around here. <laughs> Maybe that's where you focus on first. There's actually, there's pilot programs. There's all, there's so many creative things that you can do to work with the agency to manage these resources where you don't have to do ginormous environmental impact statements and and try to tackle every tree that's in the wrong place at once, I mean, that's not reality. It'd be good if it was, but it, I mean, it's just not. So help then work with the Forest Service and let's focus in this area and let's focus in this area and let's try this pilot project here and let's deal with this salvage sale here, whatever, whatever it is. You guys, as local governments, have the ability to, to do that kind of influence. And if you request a consistency review and the agency says, go jump in the lake, then you've got something in federal court that you can deal with.
Um, somebody over here said standing, and I think that, I mean, that's one of the things I was going to get to in my later talk, but that's, that's one of the issues we got to deal with. It's standing. And if you don't have a good local land use plan in place, if you, if, if you've decided that you don't want to participate as a cooperating agency, if you don't want to do coordination, and decisions are made, you guys got no standing. And not that I think federal court is always the answer, but that's what your backstop is. That's the way the law is set up now. I think with that, it's 11.30. I'm, I don't know how you want to do questions. Um, I've got some stuff to, other co to cover in the other session, but let me see if there's questions about some of this initial information. Test, test. We have a wireless mic here. Does anybody have a question for Karen at this time? I have a couple questions. Um, the first one, the, the first question I have is if there is a consistency review that exists, can a citizen request a copy of that consistency review from the commissioners? Are we allowed to ask to see it? Um, yes, her question was is if there's a consistency review request, um, can the citizens see it? Actually, the consistency review is supposed to accompany the NEPA document throughout the rest of the process. So yes, it is absolutely available to the citizens to review, along with public comments. So it would be part of like the Freedom of Information Act? Or oh, you don't even have to go that far. It's okay. supposed to be actually attached to the NEPA document. So we could just walk and say we want to see it? Yeah. Okay. The second question, and I think you kind of sort of answered it, was um, if I understood you correctly, our local government, if we went to the county commissioners and said, look, we want one of these steering committees, we want to create one, can you please start that process, then we could create a committee um, of local citizens to participate. Okay. On the local steering committee, let me, let me make sure I've got that really clear. The local steering committee can absolutely make no decision. Right, but if, if, we, were, if, you, if we say the commissioners wanted to become a cooperating agency, but we don't have the resources monetarily or within the commission itself, could they create a committee to help them and assist them in being a cooperating agency? Yes. Yes. So the way that would work in that, I mean, we do that a lot in Wyoming because we got small rural counties like you guys do. The, the county commission will say, for example, on the Bighorn National Forest, they just went through this humongous land use plan update. The county commissions and the conservation districts all jointly said, we want to be cooperating agencies. They didn't want to send, I mean, there was like, what, four or five counties and that many conservation districts. Everybody got together. They appointed a representative. They represented them at all the, these various meetings. They went back and reported to their boards. The boards would then vote on, we like this policy, we don't like this policy, we like this, we don't like that. So you can do it okay. like that. The, um, when you're building these things, you were saying with the land use policy, should have relevant economic details. I'm, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying get fairly detailed about it. Like, if, in, like you said with the coordination, define coordination. It's a, if somebody says, well, I want to cut down trees, well, define what you're What's your definition of cutting down trees? Yeah. You're saying get fairly detailed about Yes, I think they should be fairly detailed. Okay. Because I'm looking at it, I mean, I can't help it. I look at everything from what can I argue in federal court. And you can't, I mean, the federal court does not care about generalities. I mean, you guys have Judge Malloy. I'm not sure what he likes. But there are other, <laughs> we got other judges. And so, so I mean, they're just not going to help you out with a generality. That's the way the system works. So l l this is my last question. Um, if we did all of the above and had all of our ducks in a row in that manner, would that help us to mitigate the, um, the opinions coming in from, like, say, the dude in Cleveland or the guy in New York that say, hey, you can't cut down those trees because we think trees are pretty and we don't care that there's a six-inch I mean, we'll go up and look at Beaver, the Beaverhead National Forest, which is just a wreck waiting to happen. Um, so 
would doing all of these things, if we had all of our ducks in a row, allow us to have a larger um, power of opinion than that person out in New York? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Oh, my name is Tanya Drayton. My name is Ron Worth. Karen, my question is, because it's becoming more and more evident that we have a land use plan that is old and incomplete and not very helpful in regards to some of the things that you've discussed. I know you have a lot of experience with these sort of sorts of things. What would be the most one of the most effective ways for us to arm twist our county commissioners into moving forward? Um, he always cuts right to the heart of the matter. <laughs> I had one of your county commissioners was at dinner with us last night. I didn't see that he was opposed to any of this at all. Um, I mean, I don't know, I'm going to tell you, I don't know your county commissioners very well. I would say, though, that you got, that the citizens have the authority because you got the power of the vote. Uh, I mean, that's what we have to do with the rest of these guys. I, I tell them, you don't do what I think you ought to do. I'm not voting for you next time. Um, I have seen um, citizens groups do petitions. A petition is just simply, I mean, you guys know what petitions is. It's guaranteed by the First Amendment of the Constitution, the right to petition for redress of grievance. There's no reason that you can't do that to your, with your county commissioners just like you can to any other elected official. So, so if you think the county's not getting the message, I'd put together a really short petition and I get all your friends and neighbors who think this is a good idea to sign it and I go talk to them about it. Or I'd, I mean, I'd approach them and ask them. Let me just put a little bit of context on that in case anybody in the room doesn't know. In 2012, our county commissioners passed the natural resource policy uh, that, that is our land use plan. And it's a 31 page document and they put it through a very, very public process. And it's actually a very good start in my opinion. I would agree with that. Uh, I just think it lacks detail. I would, I would add detail. I think, but I think the land use plan is a good start. That's it. Question, Elaine? Please state your name. Uh, my name is Elaine Wilman, and I first want to thank Teresa for having the intelligence and courage <laughs> to bring you here. And I'm so grateful on behalf of myself and many others that you came in spite of the rudeness you endured. So thank but you for that. My those question, people outside are fine. Well, well, the Missoula and I'm a little worried about. I will. Yeah. I want to tell you all right now. Do not believe what you read in the newspaper. Oh, we don't. We don't. <laughs> but but the people out front, I have no problem with. Yeah. They are. They were polite when we came yeah. in. There yeah. wasn't an issue. They got a right to express their opinion. I think it's fine. Well said. Um, my questions are about NEPA. It, NEPA has categorical exclusions uh -huh. and categorical exemptions. And here in Montana, we have a three-party agreement that is going through a process uh, between the federal government, the state of Montana, and a tribal government. And that federal agreement uh, is excluded from NEPA or somehow circumventing NEPA when it affects the human and economic environment of 11 western Montana counties and all of the waters in those counties. How uh, are those three parties avoiding NEPA when there are federal dollars involved, federal agencies involved, state dollars? How are they avoiding that legally? I'd have to look at the agreement. I have no idea. I mean, NEPA is, there, yeah, I mean, there are, NEPA, there are several ways to comply with NEPA. There's the giant EIS that's normally that thick that has horrendous, boring reading, unless you're stuck with reading it. And then you have categorical exclusions, but they all have to go through a NEPA analysis. So I don't know your, I mean, I don't know your specific question, so I don't know how to answer it. 
I've been searching for the appropriate categorical exclusion for something that affects the environment and economy of 11 counties. The closest I'm coming is they're saying, oh, it's just policy, it's just paperwork. It's just a compact. And they're, and, and they're shining on NEPA, and I don't, my own opinion, I don't believe it's legal, but there's been no outcry by anyone uh, requiring a closer look at the impact, the economic and environmental impact of a small government taking over 11 waters in 11 counties. It's just an amazing thing to me that NEPA doesn't come into play. Hmm. I, I, I have to look at the documents. I have no idea. For anyone who might not know, that's Elaine Willman. She is a published author and uh, one of our experts in Indian law. Okay. Hello, I'm Dawn Monroe, and please forgive me, I'm a novice, I am learning, and I'm trying to understand. So a land use policy or a resource policy, whatever you call it, is focused on the needs of that specific county, represented by culture and history, um, the economic needs, and the environment. And my concern is, so if our county has one land use plan, and another county has another one, and their environmental choices are negatively impacting the quality of life in our county, how is there a coordination among counties? What's the role of the state? What's the role of the federal government? And then what's the role of the local government? How do those layer so that there is not harm being done from one place to another place. And then my other question is, it's very easy to represent economic needs. I, I think all of us understand how we can find the data and we're able to do that. But when you say environmental or environment, what specifically are we talking about? The macro environment, um, making sure there's rangeland for elk, or are we talking about just the quality of air and water? Thank you. Okay. Excellent question. Um, let me start. I'll start with your first question. What the federal statutes say is that this is a government-to-government -government relationship from the federal government to each local government. So, so what you can control is within your or Valley County or where, whatever county you're from. That's where you're going to make your recommendations. That's where you're going to consider your environment and all that stuff. If a different county is looking at something totally different, because that's who the citizens are, that fits within their border. Now, I realize there is going to be some crossover between one and the other. Um, the states are, are not involved in this government to government. They have their own process. They can do their own thing. If your governor wants to be involved in direct coordination, he can do that. It's just not the same, and he can't. What his coordination is, is not going to influence or make yours any different because it's, because you guys don't have to go through a middleman, it's just a direct coordination. With the federal government? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so let's, I mean, I think it's easier for me to talk about specifics because that's, that's easier. So if we're talking about the dam situation and you've got, what's your next county over? Missoula, Missoula County, okay. So say they're going to do a dam in Missoula County. I don't even know if that's upriver or downriver, but just pretend like I know what I'm talking about here. Okay, so you've got, they're going to do a dam, but it's going to affect your water rights here or your fisheries here or your whatever here. What you're telling them, the Forest Service, whose land this is on, is that you're not just considering what Missoula County wants by building this dam. You now have to take a local, you're going to look at their local view, but you have to consider our local view. And our local view is, is if you screw up our water rights, 
we're not going to have enough for livestock grazing or fishing or whatever, whatever it is you say. The federal government, I have learned, actually does a really good job of looking at the macro view. What we're trying to do with these local land use plans is saying, in addition to you federal government looking at the macro view, we want you to consider our local view. And that's where, you know, just after reading so many EISs, that's where I think that the problem comes, is that they're, you know, when they look at, at an industry and they look at the economics in an industry, they're going to say, well, you know, something that we do in Cheyenne, Wyoming isn't really going to affect the economics in Sublette County over on the western side of the state. Therefore, there is no economic harm. Well, there may, may not be on a statewide level. You get down, though, and look at the economics in Sublette County and you've got a problem. And so that's what we're trying to do is to get them... I mean, they're going to take a, nat a macro view naturally. What you're trying to do is, get, is to say, here is local economic data. Here is local environmental data. You've got to consider that as well. Because that's where I think so often in these federal decisions, I think that's what's missing. Is, is you're right, it may not affect people in Bozeman, so bring it down to our level and look at the effect on us. All right, now your second, help me with your second. Oh, yes, your second question. When you're talking about protection of the environment, I think we're talking about the entire environment. We're not just talking about, about you know, clean water and clean air. I think you're talking about healthy forests altogether. Now, when an agency does an EIS, what they look at is, quote, desired future conditions. You know, this is what we ought to, this is what the forests look like. It's only... You know, historically, forests had, and I'm really making up numbers here because I grew up in a state with not a lot of logging. You know, hell, historically, we only had 10 stems per acre in our forest. Now we got 100. Is 100 stems per acre a healthy forest? Probably not. It's not good for the wildlife. If you had cattle grazing in it, can't graze cows there anymore because there's no grass because you've got the canopy so tight. You've got, you've got all these problems. So that's the kind of stuff that you need to be looking at. It's all tied in with the environment. I think, air, I think clean air and clean water is one of the things. In fact, when I look at local land use plans, most of them kind of miss the clean air component. And the truth is it's because there's, I mean, we get catastrophic wildfires, but Montana seems to like, have the corner of the market on them. <laughs> just from, I mean, just from what I'm looking at in the newspapers. And so, so if I'm going to write a local land use plan for River Valley County, I'm going to say you need clean air and clean water data in this because this is really important to us. But I think you need to be looking at, at our, is our timber healthy? Um, you go to Colorado, and they got thousands of acres of bug kill trees. I mean, it's, you drive, you know, along I-70, it, there's nothing green. It's horrible. So their local land use plans are going to have a big component in them of bug kill trees is not a healthy forest. How do we deal with the bug kill or, you know, whatever the issue is? So I think it's everything. Thanks, Teresa. Um, Karen, in our county, we had a situation where uh, we dealt with wildfires most of the summer or a par portion of the summer, and this was actually a couple years ago. And as soon as the wildfires were under control and weather had cooled down in September, and um, the Forest Service decided to start prescribed burning again. And so we were dealing with unhealthy air and smoke, um, and they actually violated I believe they get an air permit, a, a burn permit from the state. And the state Department of en Environmental Quality ended up um, fining them for that. Earlier in the presentation, you had said that the federal government doesn't have to comply with state law, so I'm trying to figure that one out. Oh, okay. Okay, in that... All right, she was asking about complying with state law with regard 
to the air quality permit. Actually, under the Clean Air Act, they do have to get, you have to get a permit, whether you're federal government or state government. The, the federal statute says you have to comply with state air quality permits. That's why they have to do it. What I was referring to is if there's not a federal statute telling the federal government they've got to comply with state law, then they don't have to comply with state law. But in the air case, you've got a federal statute that says state wins, and they, so they've got to do it that way. So I have a similar question in the similar vein. Our DNRC does a really good job of managing our state lands and fighting our fires. But the federal government has prevented our airship from fighting fires because it carries too much water and it flies too fast. And I don't know if we're taking, I'm taking you too far off course, but what can we do as state legislators to address that issue? Because we have not actually found a reasonable solution for that problem. Do you know? The first question I politely ask federal agencies is, what authority are you acting under? I mean, don't be obnoxious. But I think people, when you look at the Constitution, it's pretty particular. It says that federal agencies have to have a statute or a requirement to do whatever it is they're going to do. And so if I'm, a, if I'm the state legislature, I'm going to go to the Forest Service and I'm going to say, what federal statute can you cite to me that says we're not going to let your fast planes fly or whatever, I mean, whatever it is. Whatever it is they're saying. So that's the first question I would ask, is figure out what federal statute they're relying on or what federal regulation. If it's, a, if it's a, simply a policy, that's different. Federal courts have looked at policies and they said policies do not have full force and effective law. And, full, and if you don't have full force and effective law, that's, that's something that's discretionary to follow. And I've actually been unhappy with federal courts when I'm trying to force a federal government to follow a policy and they say, sorry, you, we're not going to do it. It's really frustrating, but, but that's what the, the courts say. And so, so I think you need to look at, is this a statute? Is this a regulation that's actually been through public notice and comment so that it has full force and effective law? And it's, if it says, you know, no state help, then, then I think you guys got to go to Congress. Because your, your state legislature can't fix it. You got to go to Congress. If this is a policy or if it's something that doesn't have full force and effective law, then I think that you can. You can look at your local plans. You can, you can look at other ways to be able to deal with this issue. But that's your, your first question's got to be, why? Why are you, you know, what's your statute? What's your legal authority for saying, you can't help us. Tanya Drake, again, my first question is to Teresa. You mentioned on the um, 2012 there was a land use policy. Do you have any idea, was that forwarded? Yeah, was it forwarded um, to, to the what? To the federal agencies, was it forwarded? Do you know? And if it wasn't forwarded, um, how do we go back to our commissioners and ask them to, to forward it? Hey, well, we got. It. Okay. Thank you. How you doing? My name is Vince Marlin. I've been trying to absorb all this stuff, and when a when a policy is established through this one of these federal entities and it goes against the grain of the community. Um, is there timetables on recourse from that community once one of these policies are established? Uh, and, and in other words, is there a timetable that has to be established as far as when the 
community can go back or these boards or the county commission can go back and attempt to change a policy? Or would that be, um, if it's totally like against the grain of the community, through going to the federal courts in order to try to change that particular policy or rule? Okay. Um, there's two answers to your question. One of them is, is if you've already got like a forest service land use plan in place, the agencies are required to amend that if there's, quote, significant new information. So if you come up, say your county comes up with a, a land use plan with significant new information or your conservation district, then I would petition the federal agency to amend their land use plan based on, on significant new information. And I, and I mean, I can't tell you that, you know, significant new information means three pages or ten pages. I mean, courts don't get that carried away. But, but I, I think you have a good argument to say that a significant land use, local land use plan is significant new information for amending the federal agencies. Now, if you, if you say you have the Forest Service or somebody is making a decision and you, you local government are participating, you requested a consistency review and the agency said, I'm not doing it, go jump in the lake, you've got First, you have to do what they call exhaust administrative remedies. And normally, that after that final decision is issued, it is a certain number of days to, a, to do a protest. Um, it depends on the decision. Sometimes it's 45 days and sometimes it's 60 days. You go through the protest period. I've got to tell you, I'm not a big fan of the Forest Service protest process. When you're talking about BLM, you actually get assigned to an administrative, independent administrative law judge, and it's like a court hearing. Forest Service, you, you are protesting to the next higher line officer. Um, I have griped about that process for 30 years. I, I don't think that it is a fair process. The problem is the Administrative Procedures Act requires you do that, so do it. Once the Department of Agriculture has made a decision, you have six years to appeal. Um, I usually tell people though if you're waiting six years you're, the judge is going to look at you like you're right you know you lived it for that long why in the heck are you whining about it now but but statutorily that's what you have is a six-year statute of limitations all right i'm on now my name is land tawny i have a question for i think you've done a great job today talking about the existing framework that we're working in and talking about the opportunities to engage there What's your thought on new legislative proposals that would give local communities potentially uh, veto power over land use plans or de designations of monuments, et cetera? I think that only Congress can do that. Um, I, I mean, I try to stay out of the political realm because I'm not a politician and I can only represent views that are myself. I think that, that local governments need to take these opportunities to be more involved. I think that too many decisions are coming out of Washington that aren't considering people in Ravalli County or Sublette County or Laramie County or wherever it is you're from. Um, I think there ought to be significantly more involved. I know that um, Rob Bishop from Utah has got some bills out there that are talking about giving a much limiting the Antiquities Act, which in my opinion um, was significantly abused. If you read the Antiquities Act, it says you are to, de to designate the smallest area possible to protect the artifact you're trying to protect. Um, I, I mean, I looked at like Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalani. Surely that's not the smallest area possible. <laughs> to protect these things. So I, I'm not convinced that those are, those were even lawful to designate. Um, um, I am a, personally I am a huge supporter of multiple use. And I think that the land, there is enough land and enough resources that you can have everything you need to have. I think you can do oil and gas. I think you can do grazing. I think you can cut timber. I think that there is absolutely enough room if, you're, if in your heart what you want is multiple use of the public lands.
And I think that's where, that's the direction we need to go. And I don't think the last administration was going that direction. I think they were much more looking at sort of single use preferential management. And I, when I read the federal statutes, it says multiple use. And so that's where I think these lands ought to be managed. And with that, those incredible words of wisdom, I think we'll stop for lunch right there.